Uh, now uh, we are going to uh, move on uh, to uh, to Tivasol, uh, who's going to talk about uh, a little bit about some potential organ saving technology. Hi, my name is Jai Nagendran, and I am the co-founder and chief medical officer of Tivasol Transplant Technologies. Did you know that four people die every minute from end-stage heart and lung disease? That means over the course of this brief 15-minute presentation, 60 Americans will die from end-stage organ failure. That's right, end-stage organ failure is an extremely common problem. And though we have thousands of people waiting for organ transplantation, millions of people die annually from end-stage organ failure. So why don't we transplant more people? Well, the reason is because less than 1 in 1,000 people who die become an organ donor. And as a result, very few organs are available. Having said that, even fewer actually go on to become used for transplantation. In fact, of the precious few organs offered, we waste over 75% of these organs, saying they're unusable for transplantation, leading to lives lost. And that also comes at a huge cost. The cost of lung disease in 2020, just for chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, will be $49 billion. And the cost of heart disease treatment of indirect and direct costs are close to $219 billion in 2019. This is a massive burden on society. And yet, there is a multi-billion dollar industry waiting should we be able to have an effective treatment of end-stage organ disease. If we grow these organs in a lab, if they're bioprinted on a 3D scaffold, or if they come from a cryopreservation form by being frozen, or even xenogeneic models that lead to organs being formed in another being for transplantation, these all need an opportunity for assessment before quality is deemed appropriate for transplantation. Of course, we're well aware of the current lives we live in in this pandemic, which is why we're virtual here today. And unfortunately, there are many more patients with severe lung disease from COVID-19, even several months after clearing the infection. I want to highlight the sad story of Myra Ramirez, a healthy 28-year-old woman from Chicago who was admitted to hospital back in April with COVID-19. Her disease was intractable to her lungs, and on June 5th, she went on to receive a double lung transplant. And you don't need to be a physician to appreciate how destroyed that lung tissue is. Thankfully, she did return home at the end of July, though now a patient post-lung transplantation. And this is what healthy lungs are supposed to look like. And this is my donor team that has gone out recently to procure a healthy set of donor organs for us. But the reason we don't use many organs at all is because transplantation is done just like this. We pour a cold solution over these precious gifts of life, hoping that this cold time that lasts for about eight hours will be enough for us to transport these organs wherever they need to go. And then in an unsophisticated way, we take those precious gifts of life, put them in the same cooler that you might take to the beach for a long weekend, and then race them around the continent. Finally, they come to my operating room. It's a privilege to be presenting today. And as you can see, these lungs have uh, traveled the distance to get to our room here while they're still cold and still on ice. And what we're going to have to do is um, get these lungs flowing blood again back in my patient. And as you can see, these lungs right now are, are pretty white. There's no blood in them. And they're actually slowly dying as we're doing this right now. So I want to say a special hello to my favorite chief technology officer, Dr. Harry Partridge, who told me he missed all of his uh, biology learnings afterwards to uh, avoid these things. So I hope this is not too gory for you. But, but what we're going to do now is start dissecting these lungs apart. This is the cuff of the left atrium. That's going to connect back to the heart. This is the pulmonary artery. That's going to connect back to the heart that 
bring the blood out of the heart. And we're going to sew these in. So I think the next thing we're going to show you guys is once these lungs are inside the chest and ready to be flowing with blood again, what they're supposed to look like. All right, stay tuned. Okay, that should be good for now. All right, so we're just sewing up the end of the pulmonary artery here. Um, and with that, we would have completed the major anastomoses for this lung transplant to allow for these lungs to start to breathe again. And so we're going to take off the clamps now. You can see the silver clamp behind the artery I'm sewing. And we're going to purposely have a little bit of blood come out because we want to de-air it a little bit. And then hopefully the sewing has worked and we're going to then allow these new lungs to breathe in their new chest. We'll just take one more here. For fun. So let's cut and take this and then we'll allow these lungs to breathe again. Okay guys. That's the good old heart in the middle that's been kind of batted around from side to side while we do this transplant. And you can see the lungs moving up and down and slowly that natural pink color coming back into them after the long journey and like I said slowly dying throughout that journey. But these look like good lungs and I think we're going to have a good result. So thank you guys and I'll take you back to our presentation. And due to all of those uncertainties is why we created EVOS, the ex vivo organ support system by Tivasol. It allows us to have the exact same form factor of the ice cooler being compact. It also allows those organs to breathe normally with blood flowing through them at a physiologic manner. And this is done at normal body temperature. This can be done for over 24 hours compared to the 8 hours of the ice cooler allowing for extended preservation and during that period of time we can evaluate these organs to make further decisions about their quality. We can even intervene specifically to repair these organs. Of course, our technology is portable and can go anywhere which allows for equitable sharing of organs even to areas that right now are underserved. So how can we improve these organs? Well, if those organs are full of pneumonia, we can treat them with antibiotics. And by treating them with antibiotics, we're able to get to a viable, usable set of lungs. If those organs are too far away, let's say in Hawaii, we can fly them over with the EVOS device and bring them back to the mainland where they can be transplanted. And during that time in transit, they actually become better quality organs. If the lungs are wet and boggy, full of fluid during resuscitation of a donor, those organs can be dried out safely to a normal weight where they can function normally again. And even if they're full of blood clots, those organs can be actually treated on our device with clot busting drugs to lead to a safe and workable set of organs usable in transplantation. And we've done exactly that. In fact, we've performed a first-in-human clinical trial using our prototype device you see on the right, using 12 sets of organs that were going to be discarded, and all 12 sets were converted into viable donor lungs, and all 12 sets were successfully transplanted. And you see patients numbers 1, 5, and 7, all alive and happy over a year post-transplantation, when many of them would not have received a gift of life at all. This has been acknowledged by the highest level of peer review with our manuscript now in press at Nature Communications. It has also led to us developing a strong patent portfolio for our company with 48 filed patents of six patent families. Our business model is simple. We use the disposable sets that touch every single organ and that is where our revenue is mainly generated at a price of $21,000 per set of disposables. And then there's a service contract for the actual base unit that we charge the hospitals or the payer. 
And this is minuscule compared to the current price of double lung transplants, which is over $1.6 million. So anything that would improve the quality and quantity of viable donor organs is highly sought after by patients, physicians, and hospitals. Indeed, there is a large opportunity for cost savings as well. Better logistics allows for better matching of organs at better times. This means that operations will happen during the day with well-rested surgeons, which is known to improve outcomes. We won't be spending overtime costs on nursing and anesthesia as much. We would minimize the cancellation of elective surgical slates because we do operations during the night that cancels them. There would be better quality organs from minimal cold ischemia times, which has many significant cost savings, including less time on the ventilator because the organs are functioning better, less time in the ICU because the patients are recovering faster, less time in hospital as they convalesce post-ICU, and less rejection due to better matching. And that leads to less infection as well, due to improved immunosuppressive regimes. This would lead to less readmissions to hospital from complications post-double lung transplantation, which is another major cost to the system. Overall, there are enormous opportunities for savings far beyond the cost of the devices and equipment. We're doing this with a fabulous team. Myself and Dr. Freed are the founders. We're both trained internationally in cardiothoracic transplant surgery with a bright team of engineers and management surrounding us. We've hit many major milestones in our first five years since inception, including development of a first-in-human clinical trial and the beta prototype that we have available today. We move over the next two years into our pivotal clinical trials and plan a launch of the device in 2022. We've done all of this up until the clinical trial with less than 5 million US dollars, which is a fraction compared to others developing medical devices. Tivasol is excited to announce a $10 million strategic investment last week, which aids to secure our commercial pathway. The opportunity financially is large. With the appropriate assumptions of 80% market penetrance over five years, an increase in transplant volumes by 200% over five years, and a growth in transplant wait list of 40% over five years, we could have annual sales of close to $400 million over that period of time. So why would NASA be interested in Tivasol? Well, our lab is the only lab in the world that is capable of ex vivo preparations of hearts, lungs, livers, kidneys, and now even limbs. And this is a short video taken nearly six years ago now from our lab. And what is NASA doing that is of interest? They are trying to grow 3D tissue in space for the purpose of transplantation here on Earth. And to do that, they're going to need our portable devices that are a stable platform for tissue regeneration. Those organs fabricated in space can be tested for physiologic function on our devices. And finally, those synthesized organs can be transported back to Earth for transplantation on our platforms. Even for the lofty goal of deep space travel, NASA would find use of our technologies. Current strategies for induction of torpor and moderate hyperthermia include porcine models that are to be progressed to astronauts. We can mitigate the risk to astronauts by examining the planned pharmacological therapies in isolated organs to determine toxicity for prolonged exposures. And finally, with our technology at Tivasol, we're able to test pharmacological agents on isolated organs at zero gravity rather than performing small clinical trials on astronauts as a first step to mitigate risk. 
In conclusion, I would like to thank you and know that Tivasol is a company that looks to partner with NASA for our technology and our personnel who have much to offer the future. Thank you. All right, thank you. Let's open up questions. Ramona. Uh, um, does it require different uh, setup for the different organs? Will the one EVOS work for all of those five or six organs that you mentioned? Uh, thank you for the question. The form factor of the external components of it, the, the hardware, would be quite similar, being compact and portable. The internal components, however, would be specific to the organs that they're perfusing and, and preserving. So you would perhaps, uh, when you uh, manufacture cell these, you'd have a more kidney-based system versus a lung-based system or uh, to be more uh, fine-tuned to the particular organ? That is correct. Okay. I look forward to discussing with you during the impact tables uh, about uh, using it with our astronauts later. I'll let others ask questions now. As a follow-on to that, uh, would you have a, a single external kit with uh, insertable devices per organ? So you'd have a, a lab or, or an inventory of internal kits? Potentially, that could be developed because the external form factor would be strive to be similar. However, it's different technology for different organs. For example, the heart technology that's being developed as we speak uses two pumps rather than the single pump. So there'd be a, a lot of differences between the organs, though the form factor overall and footprint would be similar. Okay, Sharman. Yes, uh, very, very impressed with what you're doing. This is really exciting. A um, couple questions. Do you have the ability to deliver cell gene therapy? Have you thought about that from a terrestrial application? Because it's cell, cell gene therapy manufacturing, um, out, and with space manufacturing is one of the, the most difficult things. And then actually getting that uh, product to the patient is a problem. So have you thought about that at all? Yes, absolutely. And, and early on in the introduction, when I talked about the multi-billion dollar industry that could be developed, printing of organs by definition requires infusion of cell and gene-based therapy. And so those bioscaffolds, for them to be populated to allow for a actual organ, physiologically functional organ to be developed, certainly requires that uh, platform for, for instrumentation and for delivery system. And beyond that, our platform then allows for actual testing to determine if functionality is accordance to what they attempted to do with gene therapy. All right, Julian. Um, yeah, fascinating technology, uh, Jayan. Uh, a couple questions. One is, um, how long um, have you tested, or do you have a, an idea of how long you're able to? kind of uh, have this kind of, uh, prolonged cold ischemia time uh, and, and still have a um, kind of viable um, organ? That's my first question. Yes, thank you, Julian. And I'll just clarify that the time that we have on the device, we don't consider cold ischemia. We're keeping those organs at 37.4 degrees Celsius, just like it would be inside of you and I right now. So we, we call that normal thermic preservation. And we've kept human organs alive for over two days with that technology. And we've not transplanted them. That's been in the lab so far. But we believe we can go further than two days as well. Um, with what we use right now with the ice bucket that I showed you during the presentation, we really start to have irreversible damage to those lungs after about six to eight hours. So we're in a very tight window as we work today. Yeah. All right, so that's incredible. My second question is the, the slide where you talk about uh, your market penetration, you're making an assumption of 80% market penetration, which seems a little generous, but um, you know, there are only so few hospitals uh, you know, capable of doing uh, you know, these types of organ transplantations. And do you 
imagine that you know, these hospitals who buy multiple uh, devices or a one device and would use it multiple times. What, what's, what are your, um, uh, can, can you talk about your assumptions here? So we believe that each hospital would probably require two or three devices because they may be dealing with more than one donor at a time, as is very common at our large transplant centers, including our own. Um, but as I said in the presentation, the, the revenue is generated um, mainly from the disposables, which is a one-time use per organ preserved. Okay, this is again. Um, you talked of your 12, your 12 tests where you implanted 12, um, 12 pair of lungs. And you mentioned three survivors after a year. What what uh, what happened with the other nine? If you can share that at a top well, level. I, I apologize if that didn't come through clearly. All 12 survived to one year, 100% of them. There's only three in the picture. The other two people in the picture was myself and Dr. Freed, the other co-founders. So um, I apologize if that didn't come through. It wouldn't have been accepted at Nature Communications if, if those were the results. Yeah, thanks for the clarification. That makes me feel better. All right, Ben, you have a question? Yeah, um, quick question as far as on orbit, uh, you know, tissue generation and transport there and back. What's uh, your estimate for like up mass requirement? Um, you know, how big is this thing and how much does it weigh? So maybe I'll defer to our chief scientific officer and co-founder, Dr. Freed, to talk about the form factor and, and weights. Sure, uh, Darren Freed here, uh, co-founder of Tivasol. Uh, pleased to meet you all. Uh, so the, the form factor essentially is equivalent to the current ice cooler that we use. So you, you saw the picture in the presentation of the uh, Coleman cooler uh, that the lungs were going into. What we, a priority for us was to not upset the current workflow of transplant programs, um, uh, particularly on the donation side. Uh, and organ retrieval, et cetera. So what we did is we basically made our device, we squished it down to the size of an ice cooler um, and roughly the same weight. So it weighs about uh, 40 pounds um, and then that external dimension, like I say. Uh, Dr. Freed, Rich Godwin here. Um, I'm looking at uh, some experiments being done on the ISS in the next few years that are gonna be growing uh, tissue uh, and potentially, you know, advanced architecture of tissue samples. Could you explain a little bit more about how your device would be able to do uh, to be utilized on orbit and also for transportation back down to the ground? Because uh, the, the transportation is always a big issue for us. Sure. So the the portability aspect of uh, of this is has been a key element uh, for us. Um, as mentioned, we, uh, you know, portability is not only an issue for going to space, but also when you're trying to transport uh, multiple organs around the countryside. Uh, so what, uh, what we've done essentially is to take the form factor down to something that uh, could be managed by, by a single person, ideally. Um, perhaps easier to, to manage with two people, just like your, your cooler generally is. Um, and within it is the entire functionality required to maintain a, a pair of lungs or a heart or a liver or a kidney in a warm, perfused, fully functional state. Uh, now, <clears throat> I guess for, for the application for NASA, one could potentially look at other scenarios where the organs are cooled uh, to a moderate degree, say to room temperature, uh, which would then obviously significantly change the power budget for the device, since you no longer have to, to warm it to normal body temperature of 37 degrees. Uh, and you may not need to have full functional, a fully functional organ at normal body temperature simply for the purposes of transportation. Uh, so that's that's another uh, variable that would be relatively straightforward to build into the system, being able to modulate the temperature uh, to such a degree. I have one recommendation as well. Is if you don't already know them, I'd, I'd be talking to TechShop about your technology because they might be able to help you in a big way when it comes to space applications. Right. Okay. Thank you for that. Any other questions? Yes, I have another one. Um, do you have any Internet of Things components to your product? Um, so how things are performing on the inside of the box 
are being can be beamed via Wi-Fi or near fluid communication outside. Um, I care about that. I care about also tracking of the device um, as it's in transit. Um, can you speak to any IoT components? Sure. We uh, we actually did our, our prototyping on uh, IoT devices uh, that you would commonly be able to uh, acquire through like standard electronics for the suppliers. Um, in that vein, we've actually taken that forward into our, our production device where the user interface is essentially on a tablet uh, that the user can hold. So, for example, they could be sitting in the front of the ambulance or the, the uh, taxi, if, as the case may be, or the airplane, helicopter, uh, spacecraft, uh, and the organs themselves are back in a storage hold. Uh, and the, mon the user could be interacting with them through that ta tablet interface, wireless interface, um, so that you could uh, not only be monitoring the condition of the organs, uh, but also intervening, changing parameters, et cetera, on the fly uh, during transport. Um, you know, within our jurisdiction, where we have long transport times, um, it was my philosophy when we started this technology that we might as well take advantage of that transport time uh, to in intervene on the organs uh, and get and get them functioning better. In terms of the data acquisition, data warehousing, data analytics, uh, et cetera, uh, that is another key component uh, that we're interested in because as we develop this further, it is very likely that we will be able to identify novel metrics of organ function uh, or predictability of post-transplant function um, that we currently don't have access to in, uh, in an intact donor. Um, whereas if you separate the organs from the donor and you're intensively monitoring all of these data points, um, we may be able to generate novel uh, endpoints that we can use to predict post-transplant function. Um, so that data warehousing, data capture, et cetera, is, is critical for us as well. Um, not only from that perspective, but also from helping the end user troubleshoot uh, if they're having difficulties with a set of organs, you know, having access to that data uh, in a real-time sort of manner. Uh, so that's, that's a, a significant component of what we're doing from a software perspective. All right, we have time for one more question. You. So, go ahead. Go ahead, Mary. I've already asked. Um, you said that you can keep hearts alive for two days. Um, I wondered if you can speculate on how far you think you can push this. Is it possible to go a week? Is it possible to go a month? So, so I was talking specifically about lungs at first, uh, Dr. Partridge, but um, hearts potentially could go for that period of time as well with maybe varying the conditions by which they're preserved, uh, keeping them currently at normal body temperature. They certainly can be extended out much longer than our ice cooler can have hearts in them because with the ice cooler, hearts are very sensitive and even after four hours, there's damage. But in terms of the projections for how far we can go, that will really come with collaborations in other areas of industry with interest in hibernation and developing techniques to allow for longer periods of storage. Ultimately, the platform will allow for us to deliver that organ and then f test it to show that it's functional at the time that it's to be used. So whatever happens in between and whoever the partners are that want to intervene on that organ to allow for that extension of period, including maybe even developing immunosuppressive regimes specific to the potential recipient are possibilities, but our device will show you if that organ is able to work at the end of all of that as well. If I could just quickly add to that, uh, the uh, there was a group at the University of Zurich uh, who just recently showed that they can keep the liver, uh, human or porcine livers, uh, alive outside the body for a week uh, on their device. So this the the whole idea of um, moving towards essentially organ banking. Uh, so right now we have a blood bank that's you know that has revolutionized how we do transfusion medicine. The idea of having an organ bank, I think, is something that we are we need to be thinking towards as a transplantation community, um, where you can schedule uh, the transplants based on the organs you have available in your bank. Um, that's you know that's not that far off. I have I have one comment. Wow. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Congratulations to the whole, uh, to all the participants and, and especially to the winners. Before we uh, head out, I want to just uh, 
give a big thank you to the NIA team. Uh, you guys have done a great job. Um, this was my first event and, uh, and between the interactions that we had with the companies, but also uh, all of the facilitating that's been done, uh, all of the all of the work in the coaching, and uh, and quite frankly, you guys holding my hand through this as I learned it too. I really appreciate all of you guys, uh, and this was a great experience for me, and I th I think it's been a great experience for everybody. So thank you guys. Uh, I want to make sure that anybody who's watching the live stream right now that you guys are aware that we have our cycle two event coming up on October fifteenth and sixteenth. So please join us for that, where we will have another round of 10 companies uh, showing us how their dual-use technology can benefit NASA while still stimulating commercial markets. Thank you.